Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 76 of the Ask Historians podcast. So today's topic is, is a real doozy. Uh, it's going to be the first of two parts where we're going to be looking at the kind of the, the political transformation of the Middle East at the end of World War I. So this is going to basically cover the uh, the fall of the Ottoman Empire and then kind of the, the, the divvying up of the Middle East um, you know, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, all those places that, you know, Palestine, uh, what would become Israel, uh, even a little bit about Egypt as well, and, and some of the Gulf states and down into Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, kind of looking at how that transformed from being the Ottoman Empire into the modern nation states we have today. Uh, this first episode is going to be very, very heavy on the Ottoman part of it, particularly uh, the really just on Turkey and World War One and the various wheelings and dealings that were going on in, you know, while World War One was still going on, uh, before the second episode is going to move actually further kind of more into the, the post-war period. Although, as as we'll note in this episode, the post-war period in for in the Middle East, the World War One post-war period, really doesn't start until like the 20s. Uh, it kind of dragged on a little bit longer in the area uh, for some various reasons that we'll go into. Uh, so again, this first episode, uh, very Ottoman uh, Turkey centric, and then we're going to move down into uh, the, the Arab Middle East as well. But before we do that, I, I assume you all want to hear about uh, this month's book giveaway. So we have uh, an excellent selection of books, and because, you know, it's December, it's the holiday season, uh, we're going to go ahead and just pick two winners this month, okay? Uh, so first of all, the, the books we have up, uh, the first uh, selection we have offered is by our guest today, Captain Buck, and that will be Eugene Rogan's The Arab's History, which we, I think we've had uh, featured before. Uh, the next book comes from our previous uh, guest, Snapshot 52, and that is Vine Deloria's Custer Died for Your Sins. And then our third section comes from user Uncovered History, and that'll be Terry Bhutan's Taming Democracy, The People, The Founders, and The Troubling End of the American Revolution. And finally, my suggestion this month is Eugene Crosby's Ecological Imperialism, The Biological Expansion of Europe, 900 to 1900. So if you've ever wondered where uh, essentially Jared Diamond cribbed his ideas from, that's it right there. Uh, so it's an excellent selection of, uh, of books this month. I'm very proud of it and happy with them, which is, you know, why we're part of the reason we're going to do too. So, uh, our first winner is Eric Hack and our second winner is Alec Barnaby. So I'll be contacting you both through the emails that you have listed on uh, your Patreon accounts uh, within the next couple of days, and we can arrange some shipping. And hopefully I'll be able to get to you, unless you're living, if you're living in the States, I can definitely get it to you, you know, before Christmas. It'll be an early Christmas gift. Um, if, if not, it, it takes a little bit more time to ship uh, overseas, you people and the rest of the world. For now, though, enjoy this wonderful episode. And oh, just to let you know, there there is a bit of a sound quality change about halfway through, simply because I ended up having to switch over to my local side of the recording rather than using the uh, my guest's local recording. Um, but I mean, it's noticeable, but it's not it's not huge. Sound quality is great throughout, so enjoy. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. Today, I'm here with Captain Buck, who goes by, uh, well, that's what he goes by on Ask Historians. Outside of that, he goes by Andrew. Today, we're going to be talking about kind of the end of World War I, particularly in the Mideast, and how it kind of laid out um, what would eventually become uh, the modern-day boundaries of our nation-states there. But um, for now, um, Andrew, what got you interested in the subject? Sure thing. Uh, thanks, Sean, and thank you for having me uh, on the show today. I guess I think having listened to uh, some of your previous podcasts, I think like a lot of people in sort of their mid twenties who are interested in these kind of topics, I think uh, it's a bit cliched, but nine eleven was was kind of a, an early childhood experience, and then was followed by our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think um, that just got really, me really interested in what was going on in the Middle East and, and understanding uh, that part of the world. Um, so then, when I was in high school, I um, was lucky enough to have the chance to take some Arabic classes, um, and I really enjoyed that. After that, when I was sort of looking at universities, I had a good idea that that was what I wanted to do. I applied to, to one university in the U.S. Uh, that I got into that I, I thought I would enjoy, and it, it was a bit hit or miss. Their Arabic program wasn't wasn't quite what I wanted, so then I applied to um, 
did one year there and then applied to a university in the, in the UK, which their system is much more, um, you basically pick one topic and that is what your degree is in. So I did, I did Arabic for, for four years, which included, uh, living in, uh, Egypt just after Mubarak fell. Um, and I was there 2011, 2012, which is an interesting time to be there. Um, and I've more or less been, been doing that ever since. Um, in terms of this topic in particular, um, I think it's so much has been written, I think rightly that, that this time period played a critical role in the history of the region, but it was clear to me pretty early on that it was not all of it was right. <laughs> um, and so I was just always really interested in getting sort of to the bottom of what, what exactly happened with these treaties, with these discussions, um, uh, during and, and after world war one and, and what the impact of that was on, uh, the modern Middle East. Yeah, because they do have, you know, these rem- these treaties that are ironed out here do have these ramifications that exist until today, which, uh, you know, we are obviously going to talk about. But for now, uh, why don't you go ahead and just drop us right into the middle of World War One and tell us what the situation was, you know, in the Middle East, in, you know, in the, at that time, the Ottoman Empire. Right. So uh, I think I think one thing that's that's worth discussing, I assume, you know, after all these episodes, I know you we always have the um, sort of the, the thread on the on the subreddit with uh, maps and links. And I think this is definitely one where having, uh, for our listeners, just having kind of maps at hand to, to look at the kind of the region that we're dealing with would, would be really helpful. So in 1914, when war breaks out, the Ottoman Empire has more or less lost its um, European territories. It controls basically those parts of Europe that it does today, extending from you know, today's Istanbul to about the city of Adirne. Um, then I believe known as Adrianople, and the other states of the Balkans are, are at this point um, independent. So about half of the population and territory of the Ottoman Empire are what is today modern Turkey, and then the other half consists of the the Arab states that extend down, um, if you were to uh, just sort of go straight south from Turkey, so from um, the city of uh, Alexandretta, modern modern Iskandria, down to uh, the Gulf of Aqaba on the Red Sea, and also the Hejaz, which is controlled by, um, or I should say governed by, the Sharifs of Mecca, who are appointed by the Ottoman government. That's sort of the, the western expanse. And then to the east, it, the territories basically go from sort of the modern Republic of, of Armenia in sort of northeastern Anatolia down to the Persian Gulf to Kuwait. There are some other territories that the Ottomans ostensibly have. Um, notably, Egypt at this time has been has been occupied by the British since the late 1880s. But the um, the Khadiv of of Egypt at this point is um, a a British puppet, but it is still nominally, or I should say, de jure, uh, part of the Ottoman Empire. But that that's effectively a legal fiction. And then in the east, um, the Ottoman territories essentially extend from where roughly the modern Republic of Armenia is today, down to the Persian Gulf and, and where Kuwait is today, which um, is more or less the, ex- the extent of, of the Ottoman, Ottoman territories. And what are, you know, because we're going to be talking a lot about European powers, particularly mostly the, the British and the French here, but what were their interests in the region? Sure. So, so the British have two, two major things that, that are, are, are worth discussing. One is control of the Suez Canal, in Egypt, which is uh, obviously their point of access for the entirety of, of their imperial holdings east of there. It is, it is their, their route to India, um, which is the, the, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, and which at this time obviously includes not just modern India, but also Bangladesh and then Pakistan and um, extends into you know, partial control of Afghanistan. And then there is control of the, the Persian Gulf territories. So Britain has concluded a series of treaty organizations with, you know, what are today the the Persian Gulf states of um, of the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, with uh, Oman, which, in theory, recognize the quote independence uh, of these territories, but in exchange for guaranteeing that independence and territorial integrity um, through, you know, what they call these these crucial agreements, Britain controls the external defense and foreign policies uh, and, and trade um, of these entire territories. So even in Iraq, which, is, which has you know, Ottoman troops stationed there, the British consuls uh, operate 
a pretty pretty well functioning riverine fleet between uh, you know Baghdad and and uh, the, the mouth of the, the Tigris and Euphrates, which, which opens what's called the Shat al Arab uh, Delta south of Basra. Uh, right around the time of, of World War One, you also have the, the growing, um, and I, I suppose we'll we'll get into this a bit later, but. That tr- what what's important with control of that is initially sort of trade links between India and the Persian Gulf, but starting in the early uh, 20th century, the British are also converting their the navy, the British navy, to from coal to oil, and so in the early uh, 1900s, Britain forms, or I should say, the government takes a, a controlling stock in uh, the Anglo Persian Oil Company which by the, the outbreak of World War I is um, the primary source of fuel oil for the British fleet, which is being exported from quasi-independent uh, Persia, as it is then known, through an island called uh, Abadan, which is, uh, again, sort of at the, the very base of, uh, of Iraq, what is today modern, modern Iraq. Um, and that fuel oil is the, the basis by which the, the British fleet runs. So the British interests are, again, sort of the canal, trade, and then lastly, the new development is oil. And the French, what are they looking at? What are they interested in here? A, a mix of things. So they have traditional cultural ties with um, sort of the, the Lebanese and Syrian coast. So Mount Lebanon, which is uh, makes up about half of the territory of, of the modern state of Lebanon, is a Maronite Christian majority area. Um, they are Catholic, and the French have traditionally viewed themselves as the defenders of the Catholic faith. Um, and indeed, you know, when they do press their, their claims to interest in this region, they'll, they'll make that claim going all the way back to the time of the Crusades. Um, I think as, as strangely as that might sound today, um, it, I think, tells you a bit of kind of the logic of, of empire at this time. But they also had, in the Ottoman Empire, all of the major foreign powers uh, were granted concessions by the empire that rendered them sort of tax-free status and, and all kinds of other legal protections to to carry out trade. And so as a result, the French had significant interests in railway construction, trading with uh, you know various uh, ports along the uh, Aegean and Mediterranean coasts inside the Ottoman Empire, just various commercial interests that were connected with that as well, that they, they wanted to assert. So it was the combination of the uh, political connections that they um, had with the, the Arab coast, their historical connections there, and also growing growing commercial interests. And so even, I mean, if we're looking even kind of early in World War I, I mean, were there plans and ideas for, uh, the, I guess you could say the Allied powers, the, the British and the French at this point, to kind of seize more um, direct control over these territories following uh, what they assumed would be their successful victory in World War I? Yeah, this this question actually exists. It, it significantly predates World War I. So this is what is referred to as the Eastern Question. The Eastern Question is a phrase that basically refers to the idea of after the Ottoman Empire, then what? And the problem prior to this had been that there had never, um, throughout the course of the 19th century, been any way to get the competing interests of the British, the French, and the Russians to agree on any kind of outlook for what that should be. And so all of these powers, um, along with Austria-Hungary, given its its Baltic uh, interests, had it at one time or another in the course of the 19th century sought to preserve the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire in one form or another. So the result was that over the course of the 19th century, there was a slow chipping away at the territories of the Ottoman Empire, but no one was really willing to consider totally destroying it or or seizing the territories outright for fear of one of these powers gaining an advantage over the other. Um, and that, I mean, strangely enough, I mean, some of the ones that are, have been regarded as being most aggressive engaged in this as well. So when it looked like some of the Balkan states might gain access to Constantinople in some of the early Balkan wars, the Russians, who, of course, were perhaps the most aggressive in wanting to seize this territory, essentially put a stop to it and said, you know, we don't want a, a, a Balkan state other than ourselves to control Constantinople. And so very early on, it was it was clear that these territories were ones that now that the Ottoman Empire was outright hostile to all three parties, um, that this was going to be an area that was was going to be broken up in in some way from from a very early point on in the war. Yeah, and it wasn't just that the the Ottoman Empire was was hostile. You know, had had joined the um, you know Germany and Austria Hungary in in fighting against the uh, the British and the French, but that you know the Ottomans at that point being kind of I guess you could say, you know, a caliphate had declared it a kind of a religious war as well, right? Right. So, so 
the context for this is interesting, which is that, that Britain at this time is the world's largest Muslim country, effectively. That between their territories in, in East Africa and uh, Greater India, I don't know if it would be a majority, but certainly a plurality of the world's Muslims live in Britain. And when war is declared, um, the Ottoman Empire is actually the last of the, the major initial belligerents in the war to, to sort of enter the war. Um, that happens towards the end of October and beginning of November 1914, when the fighting in the Western and Eastern fronts has, has already been going on for a couple months. The Germans in particular are very keen to have them declare this international jihad. There's a number of uh, sort of German Arabists and intelligence officers who think that this is um, a brilliant idea and it will you know, result in the downfall of the British Empire. It doesn't quite work out. And, and partly, I think, for, for reasons that we'll get into, which is that the Ottoman Caliphate, while it is the highest religious authority that then existed, was basically a figurehead position. And it wasn't one that the Ottomans themselves had exercised very much. And so one of the things that they do to try and reinforce that from a religious perspective is to seek the support of the Sharif of Mecca, who, by controlling the, whole, the, the two holiest places in Islam, uh, Medina and Mecca, and through his uh, genealogical connections with the, the House of the Prophet, his support would have been uh, meaningful and contributed significantly to, to their, their declaration. Because otherwise, I mean, I think everyone by this time recognized that the the sultans of the Ottoman Empire were, were no more pious or holy than you know, any other European or, or world leader. Um, so, so that call um, was, wasn't, despite the British fears about its impact and the German hopes for what it could accomplish, um, it wasn't nearly as successful as, as they had imagined. You know, it was kind of, it was a non-starter from the beginning. And, and I take it that the Sharif of Mecca was not um, inclined to go along with it. No. Well, and also part of the problem is that the, his, so the Hussein as Sharif of Mecca was only appointed relatively uh, shortly before the war. Um, I would have to double check the, the precise date, um, but it was within within a few years that he had occupied the position, and it was a, a hereditary position. Excuse me, it was a, a familial position within the Hashemite dynasty that was under the remit of the Ottoman Emperor, or the Ottoman Empire, to appoint. The result being that many members of the Hashemite family, including Hussein were kept as effectively hostages uh, in, in Constantinople during their upbringing uh, and were raised at the Ottoman court. So the terms of that, that political contract were that the Heshemite family would have a certain degree of autonomy in the Hejaz, um, but that that autonomy could be uh, withdrawn more or less at any moment up to and including uh, death. So in the months before the eventual, eventual declaration of the um, the Arab revolt, um, Hussein becomes aware of the fact that the, the Ottoman government is actually plotting to have him killed. And that, that discovery is more or less puts the kibosh on, on any notion of, um, you know, getting a better deal from the Ottomans or, or anything to that effect that would have allowed him to, uh, to cooperate. Well, let's turn back to what the Europeans are planning here then, because, you know, starting in 1915, uh, we have this kind of series of um, overlapping, almost contradictory uh, agreements and proclamations and kind of uh, overall general plans for what the, particularly the British wanted to have come out of uh, the end of World War II, or sorry, the end of World War I. Right. So uh, th this is where I've, I've tried to, to prepare sort of timelines as best as I, I can on this. So the, the first thing that is decided, and I think the, the, the longest reaching goal of, of any of these powers who are the, the most sure about what they want is that the Russians want Constantinople. And so that preliminary set of designs is agreed um, with the Russian, between the Russians, the French, and the British in February and March uh, of 1915. To accomplish that, and also to sort of help just end the war outright, so they, so they hope, there's the, the faction of the, the British government and British war planners who are known as the Easterners, who think that if they can just crush the Ottoman Empire quickly, then they can, then they can end the war in the West. Um, so with that in mind, you know, the Gallipoli landings are, are carried out in, in April of 1915 in the hope of eventually forcing the Straits. Um, and I, I, don't, I, I don't claim to be too much of an expert on, on the Gallipoli campaign. It um, obviously gets a lot of a focus in, in Australian military history and that kind of thing. But um, I think for our purposes, it just it doesn't go well, um, to put it lightly. But at this time, Britain is starting to think much more seriously about what it wants and so in 1915, it, it convenes a committee 
run by a man named uh, Maurice de Bunsen, whose primary or I think leading figure on the committee is a man named Mark Sykes, who we will discuss further um, for some of these later decisions and, and um, agreements, um, tries to set out what the, the options and scenarios are for after the fall of the Ottoman Empire at the end of the war and what Britain wants to get out of that. So just quoting from my copy of uh, Eugene Rogan's History of the Middle East, um, he describes the, the, the outcome of, of what Britain wants uh, in this as, quote, the, the preservation by Britain of its position in the Persian Gulf, um, to bring all of Mesopotamia under its control, and a land bridge linking Mesopotamia to the Mediterranean port of Haifa. What's interesting is that despite all of these conflicting agreements that would come later, that set of British objectives actually comes very close to being what, what the map ends up looking like. But the it's the other agreements that I think get, get Britain into trouble because they, they do, um, I think as you alluded to, result in a number of conflicting promises. So in July of 1915, you have the start of what are known as the Hussein McMahon correspondences, which are a series of letters between the Sharif of Mecca, uh, Hussein, and Henry McMahon, who um, I believe is the governor general of Egypt, discussing the possibility that that Sharif Hussein would launch uh, a revolt of some kind with the support of, of the Arabs of the Ottoman Empire's territories and trying to define what Britain's level of support for those territories would be. And is this during um, the time when we have, you know, Lawrence of Arabia and, you know, this kind of romantic notion of this British military officer going out and, you, you know, uniting the Arabs um, behind him kind of thing like that? Sort of. So, I mean, if you've seen the film and, and anyone who's listening, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful film. It's one of my favorites, even if it is a, a sort of historical nonsense. This is the part uh, of the film when Lawrence is just sitting in the map room, just quite bored. Um, he is, uh, at this point, an intelligence officer in, in Cairo, um, who is, um, as the film depicts, uh, sort of sitting in the map room, trying to contemplate uh, you know, sort of major military actions, which ultimately, however, are not um, within his control to, to order or to otherwise carry out. I think it's more important to understand the Arab context for these for these discussions and promises. So prior to the war, you have the emergence of a number of, of secret societies, both civilian and military, in the Arab portions of the Ottoman Empire. Um, the two most prominent of which are uh, Al-Fatat um, and Al-Ahad, which means the, the covenant. These are... Um, I'm going to mix these up, but I think it's Al-Fatat is a military organization uh, organized out of Iraq primarily by Iraqi uh, officers of, of the Ottoman Empire. And Al-Ahad is um, more of a, a cultural association of the basically the, the Arab elites of, of greater Syria. And they come together to draft uh, what is known as the Damascus Protocol. And this is a document that is given to, to Faisal, who is Sharif Hussein's son, while he is sort of shuffling back and forth uh, between Constantinople and, and doing business for his father, that lays out their vision of what an Arab territory after, after the war ought to be. And it's that document that really gives Sharif Hussein the authority to be making the kinds of promises that he does. And the British are initially very, very skeptical uh, that this document is, is real. Um, or that Sharif Hussein can, can deliver on what he promises. In other words, why would the urban elites of Damascus or uh, Beirut or what have you rise up to support a, a religious Bedouin tribal figure in, in the Hejaz? Um, it did not make sense to them. And it's not until basically the in one of the prisoner of war camps that is set up in Cairo, the British debrief a, an Arab officer who was a member of one of these secret societies who had been captured at Gallipoli who independently confirms the reality and content of the Damascus Protocol and makes it clear that, that when Sharif Hussein is making these statements, he is speaking on behalf of, of the Arabs of these societies. And um, the British change their tune very quickly. Yeah, but but in one sense, they change their tune very quickly in a very different way because you know it's not long after these kind of Hussein-McMahon discussions that we have the very famous Sykes-Picot agreement. Right. So at the... Conclude the, the concluding what is taken as the concluding letter of the Hussein McMahon correspondences is a letter that is signed on on twenty fourth the twenty fourth of October nineteen fifteen and I'll just I'll, I'll read some some parts of that that I think are most relevant um, and those describe the territorial reservations that that Britain is laying out when it is making these agreements with with Sharif Hussein and so that says quote 
the two districts of Mersina and Alexandretta and portions of Syria lying to the west of the districts of Damascus, Homs, Hama, and Aleppo cannot be said to be purely Arab and should be excluded from the limits demanded. And then it goes on to say, as for those regions lying within those frontiers wherein Great Britain is free to act without detriment to the interests of her ally France, I am empowered in the name of the government of Great Britain to give you the following assurances and make the following assurances and make the following reply to your letter. 1. Subject to the above modifications, Great Britain is prepared to recognize and support the independence of the Arabs in all of the regions within the limits demanded by the Sharif of Mecca. So the letter that they are signing and the agreement that they make does make it clear that France has, has some interests here. And it implies very strongly that those interests are limited to those districts um, of Mersina and Alexandretta and, quote, the portions of Syria lying to the west of Damascus, Homs, Hama, and Aleppo. That last sentence is one of the, if not the most controversial sentences in, I think, the history of diplomatic uh, communications. The arguments over the translation that was used of the word district I think come come down to us as as whether or not you can describe this as a broken promise or whether the Arabs misunderstood. It's not clear whether the British were being intentionally deceptive um, in writing this and, and translating it. Um, specifically, they use the word the Arabic word wilayat, which was a, uh, a te- in, in, in translating the word district, which is a, a technical word which describes an administrative unit of the Ottoman Empire but can also in Arabic refer to just an area generally. The problem is that the British held to the idea that they were referring to a technical sort of state area, which doesn't exist, that there, that there are in fact no, no such districts in the Ottoman Empire west of those territories. And so they must have been referring to it in geographic sense of just the general area, but which it doesn't make sense. I mean, you just, you end up with these inherent contradictions in the letter with how they tried to uphold it later. But in any event, the point being that they do make it clear that the French have some interests here, and the Arabs uh, and Sharif Hussein concede this. As you say, however, they are then immediately pressed to determine precisely what those those limits are. And those discussions, as as are made between Mark Sykes and uh, Francois Georges Picot, are not made with the understanding or knowledge um, of the Arabs themselves. So Mark Sykes, who had at this time, I think, been, been sort of sent on a regional tour by, by Lord Kitchener, who is the head of the British war effort, to kind of make an appraisal of all of the eastern fronts. Um, he visits uh, India. He goes to Cairo. And when he re- returns in December of 1915, he proposes to um, negotiate a, a treaty and a discussion with the French to establish what, what their interests in the Middle East are. And the result of that is, is Sykes-Picot. Yeah, which is not made with any Arab inputs, and uh, and also at, at this point, you know, it, I, I guess my question here is that you know we're going to get even more kind of complicated when we bring in like the Balfour Declaration, and uh, my question here is really, you know, while we do have this initial input from um, you know Arab leaders saying that they will support and recognize that you know French that the French and the British have some interest in these regions, but you know, there's also this. Um, explicit support for Arab independence in there. But then we start getting these um, other uh, proclamations and agreements which are made without Arab input like Sykes-Picot and like Balfour, which kind of contradict some of these earlier conversations. So, I mean, was this a intentional part of kind of double dealing on the part of the, the British and the French here? Or was it more of a case of like one hand not knowing what the other hand is doing? I think it has to be described as a bit of both. I mean, one of the problems here is that when the Hussein, so the Hussein McMahon correspondences are conducted in secret. The Sykes-Picot agreements are conducted in secret. The only person who in the world who is fully briefed on the contents of both of these agreements is Mark Sykes himself. He has made it about as clear as mud to the British government what he's doing. There's, There's a uh, a meeting that Mark Sykes has in December of 1915 um, with sort of key leaders of the British cabinet. So Prime Minister Asquith is there, Lord Kitchener is there, Balfour, I think, is there, uh, Lloyd George is there. And he proposes to draw a line dividing French interests from British interests, more or less precisely 
um, as as he would end up doing. Um, the, the, his line, um, if I can, if I can just quote him, he says uh, that he wants to draw a line from the E in Acre to the last K in Kirkuk. Um, Acre being sort of southernmost point or city in um, modern Lebanon, with Kirkuk being a, a city in, in northern Iraq. And if you if you look at the Sykes Pico map, they would eventually sign a, a few months later. That's that's more or less precisely um, the, what what is agreed there. The, the problem is that when he is given his brief by the Arab specialists in Cairo, their understanding of what what independence meant for um, the Arabs um, was not was not what Sykes Pico understood. Um, so, or excuse me, what Mark Sykes understood. So when Mark Sykes negotiated the Sykes Pico agreement, and, and I think we'll we'll have to share the the map uh, with with our listeners, they they divide the territories not just between British and French spheres of influence, but also between which territories would be more or less uh, directly controlled by the French um, and the British. So on this map, he he places what is called the A area, which is or I should say the A and B areas, which are, are these the split between where Britain and France will have influence, but they are understood to be effectively independent areas of, of Arab control. But that's not what the people in, in Cairo meant when they said independent. What they meant by independent was that, of course, Britain will have a suzerainty or, or hegemony over the entirety of the, these Arab territories. It would be an independence agreement like the ones that they had for the Gulf territories uh, in the Persian Gulf. That that you know they would exercise almost complete control of their of their foreign policies and their trade, um, and would have preferential treatment for that trade. Which, by the way, the, the Arabs agreed to. I mean, they they made explicit in the Hussein McMahon correspondences that the one of the carrots that they were going to provide for Britain giving support to them was uh, more exclusive trade rights and favorable trade agreements, but. Sykes, I think it seems, did not share that understanding of the meaning of the word independence. And so he created these two nominally independent zones of independence divided between France and Britain, but which just couldn't possibly be squared with the idea of independence that was being promised in Cairo. Yeah, so it seems like there's a bit of confusion on the uh, British and the French side about how, you know, well, independent these areas are going to be. I mean, but it seems like the idea was you know, not something that we would call independence, but something more like a protectorate. Right. So I'm, I'm hesitant to get into the, the legal definitions of, of what a distinction between a, a protectorate and some of those sort of the crucial states uh, along the Persian Gulf Coast that the Arabs, uh, that the British had maintained. But certainly from, and from what we know of, of how sort of treaties were conducted afterwards that, that explicitly granted some of these territories independence, the idea of independence in, in the British mind for these territories was nothing like what we would today consider to be the sovereign independence of the state. But also that culturally, one of the distinctions between what, what British imperialists saw for themselves um, was that they thought, I think in, in a quite genuine way, that they were acting in a kind of hands-off or pro-development approach that did actually benefit the people they were ruling. And they, I think in their own minds, contrasted that with a more exploitative or divisive uh, style of, of French colonial governance, which which they looked down on. Um, so there were, these, these ideas were not necessarily contradictory. So, you know, when T.E. Lawrence is um, a major proponent of Arab independence, he is also um, in favor of the idea of British stewardship for that over and above the French. He views, you know, these people view their respective approaches to imperialism very differently. Now, this is also the time of, you know, of Woodrow Wilson and his 14 points and League of Nations and you know, this really kind of championship for um, self-determination. And also, uh, there was a, another kind of a proclamation, the, the Anglo-French Agreement, I believe, uh, in, towards the end of World War I, which was a bit more explicit about uh, promoting and assuring Arab independence. I mean, were, did those have any effect on these kind of prior agreements? When the United States enters the war, um, which I think is, is, I would have to double check the dates, but I mean, it's like late, late 1917, early, early 1918. Um, and Wilson uh, issues the 14 points um, in January 1918. It does change the, uh, the calculus, I think, for, for both the British and the French as to how they're going to approach 
um, how they lay out their claims. Um, and one of the problematic, one of the problems that they face is that when um, the Russian government falls in, in 1917, one of the things that the Bolsheviks do is they start publishing their copies of all of these agreements um, because ultimately the sykes peak Poe agreement um, had to be signed with the knowledge and cooperation of Russia. So some some uh, historians try to try have tried to argue that it should actually be called the Sykes Pico Satsanov Agreement because the um, the Russians played just as much of a crucial role um, in it as anyone else. So when that information is published in 1917, um, the Ottoman governor who is in control of the Middle Eastern Front, uh, Jamal Pasha, who has been, I mean, acting with with pretty horrible cruelty towards towards um, uh, the population, um, among other things, he. François Georges Picot has, when he was uh, ambassador in Beirut, left a list of the members of the leaders of all of these secret societies who were in support of these Arab movements um, in his safe at the the French embassy, which is then captured by Jamal Pasha. And he subsequently has all of the the leaders um, of this movement executed and their families um, sent into internal exile. And the conditions in these territories during the war is quite horrific. So there's... um, plagues of locust uh, strike strike the Middle East during this time in, in really horrible ways so that the suffering of people is quite terrible. But in 1917, when when these documents are revealed, the Ottomans realize that they have a bit of a propaganda coup where they come out and say, look what these imperial powers are, are going to do. Um, they're going to divide the territories. So much for, for Arab independence. Now, I don't think this was entirely a shock to Sharif Hussein. He was, by that point, briefed in one form or another about what some of these agreements with France had been made. It's not clear whether or not he was simply lied to about about what it meant, Um, but I don't think it was entirely shocking to him. But there was then, when the United States entered the war, um, an onus for both the Ottoman Empire the, the territories that were going to be divided in the Ottoman Empire and, and in Europe to at least pay lip service to Wilson's ideas um, about the 14 points. Um, even though I think this is interesting that the United States and the Ottoman Empire were never actually at war. It was still felt that that would need to apply. I mean, at this point, all of this is completely theoretical. So, I mean, when World War One actually does come to a conclusion in the East, we we end up with the, the, the Treaty of uh, Sevres, right? And that's... Um, and that's kind of a hard left turn towards dismembering the Ottoman Empire than what we've been talking about. Right. I mean, I think I think part of that would would require, I think, discussing that going back a little bit to um, how the how the course of the war actually unfolded. So when the the grand uh, Arab revolt is declared in 1916, the idea behind this and, and from the letters is as it sort of says on the tin, that it would be an Arab revolt. Um, no such thing actually really ends up materializing. You have tribesmen of the Hejaz and, and certain parts of, of lower Transjordan that do rise up and that do form this mobile army that is then depicted, you know, in, in Lawrence of Arabia so, so beautifully um, and in uh, T. Lawrence's uh, book, Seven Pillars of Wisdom. But the populations of these territories do not, en masse, rise up, and I mean that—that's the appraisal of of all of the um, you know intelligence officers at the time and afterwards. The settled territories of of the Levant are simply not not participating in this, um, and they it does not end up contributing vastly to the war effort. And then what ends up happening is that there is um, actually stalemate along the, the during what is called the Sinai and Palestine campaigns. Um, all the way until early 1917. Um, and then you have the Battle of, of Beersheba, where after several successive attempts to assault the Ottoman trench lines at, at Gaza, they are the British actually are able to break out and start advancing, advancing north and, and capture Jerusalem. And that same year and around the same time is when you also have British successes in, in Mesopotamia for the first time. So after the Siege of Kut, when the British army, the Mesopotamian expeditionary force that had been sent from India is besieged and then finally captured in really horrific conditions. And so it's a, just an, an embarrassing defeat for the British in, in 1916. In 1917, they do successfully capture Baghdad. And so what had been before, as you say, I mean, kind of theoretical, they are now looking at really significant British control of major territories and they're, they're marching north. And so by, by 1918, 
uh, you know, Damascus falls and British forces are, are just, just outside Mosul, basically. And what leads to the collapse of, of, of the, the Ottoman resistance, um, as with German resistance, is, is that basically the Salonika front in, in the Western Balkans breaks out and there is really nothing standing in the way of those forces just marching on, on Constantinople and, and just, just ending the war. So at the end of October, they sue for an armistice by appealing to the Americans um, again, on the basis that they think the 14 points are going to go quite well and um, negotiate the, the what is called the Armistice of Mudros, which is the Ottoman equivalent of the um, you know, famous uh, 11 November Armistice on the Western Front. The Armistice of Mudros, I think, is, is where you first start to see that, that this is going to be a, a massive capitulation. Um, the terms of that armistice basically involve guarantees that the British and the, the Entente and the Allies can occupy any part of, of the Ottoman Empire, that they will have control of the ports, that they will um, be able to require the disarmament of, of all Ottoman military units, and they, they proceed to do so. So um, after that, they, they order the demobilization of, of the Ottoman Ottoman army, and then Constantinople was occupied in, in November of 1918. Sevra, um, which you mentioned, I think is, is possibly worth, worth getting to a bit later, because that's in, in 1920. But between... When that armistice is signed in November of 1918 and 1920, there is, I think, a growing appetite um, for breaking up these territories amongst the, the allies, that, that this will be an area where they will be able to get significant sort of spoils from the war, but also the rise of the sort of Turkish nationalist movement and a recognition that there would be a willingness to, to fight these measures in the part of the Turks. Yeah, so we have this sort of interstitial period between... Um, the armistice and and Sevra, where you, you mentioned that you have this kind of growing uh, Turkish nationalist movement. I mean, what really, what was the the Ottoman Empire, you know, the power structure and you know in power at the time that made this agreement? What were they expecting to get out of it, and what did they not get out of it? That led to you know this uprising of you know the young Turks. Right. So shortly after. Actually, I would have to I would have to double check the dates, but basically, by the time the armistice is signed, the government that had been leading the Ottomans through the war, the the triumvirate of the Young Turks, known as the Three Pashas, um, have resigned from government, and and I think would would shortly thereafter flee into exile. Two of them, I think, then later being assassinated by Armenians uh, seeking revenge for the Armenian genocide and massacres, um, but that would be sometime later. The result was that the the armistice was agreed to by sort of the B team of some Anglophile members of of the uh, Committee of Union and Progress, which was the the um, formal committee of of the Young Turks that was running the government from this time, and they the, the person who was sent to to make this negotiation for Mudros doesn't doesn't do a very good job and is convinced by a, a better negotiator, frankly, on the British side, to agree to these terms. What ends up developing amongst the army is that, that by this point in the war, the, the Ottoman army had been um, actually commanded by Germans. Ludendorff, um, I think, is, is taken out of the Western Front. Excuse me, not Ludendorff. It was um, Commander at Verdun. I apologize for his name. Um, but was taken after after the sort of failures of the Germans at Verdun was was sent to Syria to command the armies there. The German uh, representative of the Ottoman military for many years, uh, a man named Lehman, is then then put in charge. But in the the waning months uh, of the war, those men head back to Germany, um, and the army is is in the control of of some of the the more successful officers who had who had been fighting it um, to that point, most notably. Uh, Mustafa Kemal, who is known subsequently as a result of his actions um, during this time as Ataturk. So I, I think kind of an example of the, the attitude that, that he has um, is that when this armistice is signed, d- despite the armistice, there, there is continued fight. So the British capture Mosul several days after the armistice and the French, in order to, to guarantee that they will have their interests, um, start to mount a landing at Alexandretta and inform uh, the Ottoman government in Constantinople, that they have to accept that. And so the Ottoman government orders Ataturk to withdraw, which he does not want to do. He wants to contest the landing because the, you know, the armistice has been signed, but you know, he'll be damned if, if, you know, if they take Alexandra without a, Alexandra without a fight. 
he is eventually, you know, sort of commanded or forced not to do that, even though um, he would have probably been able to successfully resist such a landing. But um, over the course of this time period, there is a growing understanding, and particularly after Constantinople is occupied, that the parliament would be and the government would be compromised. And so a grand national assembly is formed, um, I think, in, in 1919, which focuses or is, is set up in, in Ankara, you know, essentially in the mountains, um, or at least in very central Anatolia in a way that is protected by, by mountains on, on all sides, that would be able to... Um, to counteract and then provide legitimacy in a way that the, the Ottoman Sultan and the, um, the government there no longer could. So you already have this kind of massive discontent on the part of the, uh, the, the military, really, under Atatürk at this time. So is Severus kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back? Um, I think it's a little bit before then, but, but they kind of know what's coming. So at the end of 1919, the Greeks land at Smyrna. And the Greeks um, are sort of very late entrants. Um, into all this, and one of the one of the issues here is that the British by 1919 are you know starting to demobilize, um, and so there is an understanding that they just don't have the troops or the willingness to actually carry out an occupation of these a formal occupation of these territories, um, and so the Greeks on the other hand who who look to look to gain to gain quite a lot based on some of the agreements and discussions that had been made with them do, and so they they commit I think it's about a hundred thousand troops to land at Smyrna. Which is uh, modern day Izmir on on the western um, the western coast of, of Turkey, um, and this is taken as the as the mark of the start in, in many sort of timelines of, of the uh, the Greco Turkish War. With that having been done, um, and with the the British in control at Constantinople, a conference is convened um, at San Remo in in early 1920, which is sort of the Ottoman equivalent of the Paris Peace Conferences that decided what was going to happen to um, uh, sort of Germany and Austria-Hungary. The Ottoman Empire had been, had been discussed um, at, at, at Paris, uh, and we can discuss, discuss that a little bit, but it was basically decided to, to put off some of the final questions for, for some time and, and until um, a greater study of the problems had been made. By 1920, Wilson is, is effectively out of the picture after he suffers his stroke, and Lloyd George convenes the San Remo Conference to set up what the Allies want to do with the Ottoman Empire, and the result of the Treaty of Sevres, which is, um, I think, if we were to uh, share a map of it, I mean, it, it basically it just completely carves up carves up the empire, and not just the empire, but what you could plausibly call a, a Turkish nation. So Constantinople is an international zone. The French are given all of the territories that are included in the Sykes Pico Agreement, which is an area, uh, a poorly defined area known as Cilicia, which is basically the eastern portion of the southeastern portion of the Turkish coast all the way up practically to the, to the Black Sea. The Italians get an area west of that. The Greeks are given the entirety pretty much of the, the western Turkish coast. Um, and then there is provisions that are made to establish Armenian and Kurdish states um, in, in eastern, eastern Anatolia, um, with the Turks themselves only controlling a, a rump state based around Ankara. And so what, what went on with the, the, the Greek and Turkish war then? So the, the Turks decide, I believe it's immediately prior to Severa, what, what their negotiating position will be. And this is referred to as the National Pact in, in Turkish and is, I mean, remains to this day one of the sort of founding documents of the Turkish state. And what that says is that we, we accept that the Arab ter- territories of the Ottoman Empire are gone. You know, we, we cede that to the foreign powers who will decide that amongst themselves. But effectively, anything that was not under foreign occupation at the time that we signed the armistice is legitimately ours. And they make that case on the basis of those territories being majority Turkish, which is in the southeast and in, in the southeast of what is today Turkey is, is questionable given the, you know, the Kurdish and, and, and Armenian populations of those territories. Um, and also their claim to the, ter- the, the province of, of Mosul, where it's, um, I think, just flatly untrue. But they claim uh, a set of territories as being a sort of the um, effective Turkish nation um, and that they would fight to defend, defend that territory. And so the, the progress of the, the Greco, Greco-Turkish War is an effort to, to accomplish those, those goals and to basically drive out, drive out foreign occupation. But the, the, the Greco-Turkish War ended 
somewhat abruptly, if I recall correctly. Yeah. So, I mean, well, there there are a number of, of campaigns and battles um, that are fought over the course of this. One of the things that happens is in the East, you have um, these kind of breakaway states that are trying to form um, in the aftermath of this, including sort of, I think, Azerbaijan and, and uh, an Armenian Republic. Um, and the Bolsheviks in Russia are asserting their control over, over territories following the um, Russian Civil War. And so one of the first things that is sort of settled in, in these series of wars that would become overall the, the Turkish War of Independence is that the eastern borders are, are sort of established in, in lines of cooperation between between Russia and, or I should say, the you know, then Soviet Russia and Turkey. And then there are some climactic battles um, that are fought, you know, sort of just outside outside Ankara that are aiming to sort of drive drive the, the Greeks back. You know, these are sort of the, the most sort of heroic moments in, in sort of the, the Turkish uh, national uh, national consciousness. I mean, you have um, you know, these wonderful quotes from from Mustafa Kemal, who um, um, I think when he uh, at the, the climactic battle, um, uh, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this, but I believe it's uh, Sakaraya, um, where he then turns and, and says to his army, your objective is the Mediterranean forward and just orders his armies to, you know, to advance onto, onto Smyrna. And then the, one of, one of the problems here for, for the Greek side is that the Greeks have a, a king who is, uh, there's, there's basically the British effectively mount a coup uh, in, in Greece in order to get a, a pro-German king, Constantine, deposed, I think, in the end of 1917 or early 1918. And the king who is then installed, who has been cooperating um, via his prime minister, Venizelos, um, with Lloyd George to carry out this campaign, he, the king, is walking through his his gardens and is bitten by a monkey. Um, and then, as a result of this monkey bite, he dies of infection very suddenly. Um, and the pro-German king is is then restored. And the level of support or cooperation between the British and, and the Greeks at this point then diminishes quite considerably. And so there are these triumphant Turkish Turkish victories. Um, the Ataturk uh, takes takes Izmir, Smyrna, and and the the Greeks um, are, are in large part driven out. Then the question is, okay, so then what did the British do? And there's Lloyd George at this point, and along with Churchill, who, who obviously, for um, given his his prior history with 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 Gallipoli and the Dardanelles, they want to contest the Straits um, around Constantinople. The, the army officers on the ground um, uh, effectively ignore Lloyd George's orders to provoke uh, an outright conflict with Mustafa Kemal. Um, and then subsequently in 1922, there is an election in, in Britain in which the conservatives win, Lloyd George is out, and there's no interest in, in fighting a war to contest the Straits. So after that, the, the Treaty of Lausanne, which establishes uh, sort of the modern territories of Turkey, is signed between, between Britain and Turkey and then concludes um, those conflicts. So it seems like even with the the armistice, like fighting never really ended in what is modern day Turkey, that, you know, we had the armistice and then we had the kind of this proxy war uh, between the uh, Turks and the Greeks. Uh, And then by the time that kind of had uh, concluded, you essentially had the the Turks somewhat, or at least a a new faction of of Turks under um, Kemal who would become Ataturk and the the British not really wanting to go back in and, and refight World War One. I think that's exactly right. That World War One in the Middle East lasts from 1914 until 1922, um, and I, I don't think you'd be all that all that off base in saying so. Um, I think I think the other the other development that happens is we can talk about sort of how the, the French uh, occupation or establishment of themselves in Syria proceeds. But in 1920, Faisal crowns himself king of Syria, and there is a war that is fought between in the Franco Franco Syrian War. Um, which ends quite quickly, but but they, the French, in trying to set themselves up uh, in Syria, face um, some pretty stiff resistance and some pretty pretty significant challenges. And at the same time, in trying to occupy this territory, Cilicia, they are fighting what is then known as the the Franco Franco Turkish War, which um, is more difficult than they expect. And they also have uprisings of kind of bandits and, and all these other problems. One of the issues is that the I think the majority, or at least a significant portion, of the French forces that are, are used to conduct this campaign are survivors of, of the Armenian massacres and genocide. And so there is 
just kind of mutual sort of slaughter and it just it just doesn't go <laughs> very well um, and they can see in the there's a multi-month long siege of, of the city of Gaziantep where the, the French basically just conclude that there's no way that we can hold Cilicia in the face of this level of resistance um, and Syria at the same time we would be better off conceding this territory to the Turks holding on to Syria, which is what we really want. And so there's, along with a, a change in government where Clemenceau is out and a, a new premier is, is, install, is in power in France, there's just a complete change of French policy. Um, so where in 1920 they are in favor of, of Sevres and, and you know back this idea of, of carving it up, by then the French are, are really just looking to have already effectively signed a separate peace with the Turks. And the Italians follow suit, where the Italians, once the French are out, really just are willing to just take some economic concessions because they recognize that they're not going to commit the level of troops that would be necessary to do this. And the only, by supporting Sevra from that point forward, the only beneficiaries would be the Greeks, which which Italy does not want to see. It sounds like uh, our modern day nation of Turkey is set. And I, and I do want to actually turn now down towards the, the Arab regions. And as always, thank you all so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, I certainly did. And I hope we'll come back for the next episode, which is where we're really going to get into, uh, you know, these agreements we were talking about that kind of promised contradictory things. And it seemed like nobody really knew what the right hand or the left hand was doing. And maybe there was a bit of double dealing going on. Now, in the next episode, you're going to get to see how it all plays out. Um, and it's, And then we'll kind of conclude by talking about uh, some of the kind of, I guess you could say, you know, geographic determinism that sometimes goes into uh, talking about the Middle East by saying, if only we could have drawn the borders differently. So uh, I hope you come back and learn how basically all these modern nation states in the Middle East get formed. Well, not all of them. We're going we're gonna to focus mostly on Syria, Iraq, uh, and the Levant region. So Lebanon, uh, Israel, Palestine, all that. But uh, that'll be our main focus. Uh, in the next episode. So I hope you come back and listen to that and enjoy. Uh, big thanks, of course, to our Patreon subscribers. That's why, you know, you keep getting these books. Uh, I did say that I would have some YouTube episodes up on there by this episode. And uh, that, that is unfortunately not true. I just had a bit of a busy week, which is why this podcast episode is coming out a little bit late. My apologies. But I do have, uh, I will be spending actually most of tomorrow, hopefully just kind of putting put some episodes up. So uh, yeah, uh, look for that. But in the meantime, uh, feel free to browse through the back uh, episodes on uh, on Libsyn page, which is askhistorians.libsyn.com. That's Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N. Yes. Uh, and we're also on SoundCloud under Ask Historians. And we're on Google Play as well. So you can search for us on, on there as well. And of course, we're on iTunes. Everybody's on iTunes, right? Uh, so listen, rate, review, tell some friends, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and do come and join in the uh, discussion post because we covered a lot of topics on this episode at almost kind of breakneck speed because there's really so much to talk about. Um, and even though, you know, we spent... Uh, you know, Captain Buck and I have spent two hours talking about this. Uh, we didn't really, there was a lot of times you can kind of, uh, listening back to the episode, I was like, yeah, I, I can see where I was trying to move things along because I knew if we if we stopped, we uh, this would be like a nine hour podcast, which maybe we'll do someday. No, not all at once though. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the episode. Um, we're on all those places. Come join the discussion on uh, Ask Historians. Uh, it's reddit.com forward slash r forward slash Ask Historians. We sticky well, we sticky the uh, discussion post at the top of the, the subreddit there, and you can also just search through past, use Reddit's crappy search function uh, to find the other ones. Uh, and also we have a wiki page that links to all the discussion posts and yada, 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 yada. Uh, so yeah, come by. Hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll see you in two weeks, okay? You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at Ask Historians, and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.